All right, hello everyone. Uh, we're actually doing a special uh, episode of Idleman Unplugged. We're excited too because uh, Kim Walker Smith is here with us to actually lead worship at our church tomorrow morning. And I wanted to just take this opportunity to um, ask some of the questions a lot of you have been emailing me about worship music, about theology, and, and talk with Kim because I think it's so important to hear someone's heart. I think God is behind unity and hearing, okay, what does a person really believe? Proverbs actually encourages us to hear both sides before we form a judgment. And um, so we're just going to kind of talk here briefly about some of the things, some of the controversial things, her heart for worship, maybe even sharing your personal testimony. Um, this isn't my time to talk a lot. I do enough of that. This will be your time to do that. Um, but I wanted to, um, I kind of want to set the stage. Kim doesn't know I'm going to say this. It's all good. Don't worry about that. Um, when you came out to the stadium at Jet Hawk Stadium, you led worship there. We still get emails that of people just loving it. Um, I was just, I always look for, because I, I travel and, and preach and, and do the kind of the same thing, but preaching. And I look for a couple different things. And with you and talking with your husband and your team, uh, like the money issue, you know, you look at people, how do they handle money from merchandise to, uh, you know, wanting the money up front, how much money. And I just want to, you know, tell you and tell the people publicly that it was incredible that it wasn't even an issue. Your husband's like, whatever, whatever God puts on your heart and don't have to send any money up front, which is normally you have to. Um, and just the, as far as merchandise, it wasn't about selling merchandise. It was about giving it away and helping people. So the money issue was just really, um, impressed me. And then the, I also look for the popularity, uh, I issue. Like if somebody's popular or well known, um, like sometimes I'll, if I go speak somewhere, they'll say, now, uh, I know you got to get out on a plane or you got to get out of here. And, and I, I always want to meet the people. I want to, I want to pray with them and meet the people. And so I'm getting ready to leave Jethawk Stadium. It's close to 9 o'clock. I thought you're already gone. And you're still, you're still talking with people in the dark with the security lights on, ministering to people, signing books. I'm like, this is like impressive because normally a person's gone. You know, if, if they've got that rock star popularity look, they're, they're, they're gone as soon as their set is over. You know, let me avoid the people. But that was just so impressive, and I wanted people to know that. And then, of course, the theology issues, the big thing between conservatives, you know, theology. And when, you're, when you and your band, you know, love the message I gave, and it was a hard message on repentance, and <laughs> when, you're, when the band came up and said, oh, we loved it, thank you so much, I'm like, wow, what, what's, what's all this bad stuff I've heard about? <laughs> You know, Kim Walker. So that's what I wanted to do when I reached out to you. Jake Hamilton, Sean Foyt, um, Brian and Katie led, you know, uh, led our, our worship here um, when we were, we were closed. And just giving people the right kind of, um, you know, information. And then I'm going to let you talk in just a minute. But I think it's important people for them to know my background. I come from like, you know, I have the MacArthur Study Bible. I listen to Alistair Begg. I read John Calvin, Spurgeon. So I love, I love sound theology. But something happened in the year 2000 where I was overcome. You can call it in, uh, baptism, feeling, anointing, unction. The Holy Spirit just radically changed my life. So I've been on a quest to balance the power of Scripture, the power of sound theology, the inerrancy of God's Word with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because without that, you can be straight as a gun barrel theologically and just as empty. And I think that's why so many people who come against you, what and, and that, that upsets me is they're, they're so doctrinally sound, so they say, but they're dead to the things of the Spirit. That was a long introduction. Um, but I wanted, the first question I want to ask you is, you know, there's, there's big voices that come out against you, right? To do your kind of music. Have they ever reached out to you like we did? Uh, no. <laughs> well, okay. No, I was wondering that. They, like before, no one's ever wanted to sit and have a conversation like this. Wow. So they'll just post mean videos. <laughs> yes. Well, I will say, actually, um, I have gotten letters. There was one that was a four-page handwritten letter with a pencil. That came uh, through the mail one time. So, yes, I've gotten letters, and then there's all this stuff on the Internet. But yeah. no no conversations okay, good. like this. Well, because I set out to, to – because, I mean, I'll just be honest with everyone listening and you as well, 
we've been challenged to take uh, your music off the radio. Our, we own radio stations. And why do we play Kim's music? Because she's associated with Bethel from a long time ago. And so I said, you know what, Lord? I've been, I was fasting. I was praying. Before I do anything like that, that drastic, I need to have more information. I need to know where is Kim's heart? Where, where, you know, what's, and that kind of started the process. And then God opened the door to get you out here. You just drove six hours, <laughs> you, six hours, 30 minutes ago to come here and do this podcast. I mean, that, I just, I, I'm just so impressed. Me and my wife are just, um, just so impressed by you. But what about um, your experience briefly with the Holy Spirit? And you can mention your book. I, I highly encourage it. Um, I think Zondervan published yeah. it. Yep. Yeah. And I'm halfway through, and it, um, it's just, uh, you can kind of see where you're coming from with, you know, worship and, and where your heart's at. So yeah. what's your experience with well, the Holy Spirit and being saved? Yeah, a little background. Um, my parents divorced when I was four, and um, my mom was raised by two uh, Christians. Um, my grandpa was a pastor in a church. And um, do a whole series of event, events that's probably a long story for right now. Um, I ended up, when they divorced at four, I had two stepfathers after that who were very abusive. And then a third stepfather came when I was about 12 years old. And uh, he was a Christian. And before him... Church was there sometimes, but church was not something I understood to be um, something to be part of your life. I didn't necessarily understand how real God was. It almost kind of seemed like a story that you just kind of hear or you talk about on holidays. Um, I'd gone to church with my grandparents. And again, it just kind of seemed a little bit more of a ritual versus something that was like real and alive and to be had by all of us. And um, when my stepfather, the, the third stepfather came along, he was a Christian, and things really changed at that point where we we started going to a church on a consistent basis, but it suddenly wasn't we just go to church on a Sunday morning, it became part of life, like the Wednesday night services and all the services on Sunday and all the, you know, the community, the potlucks and all of the, just all the various church events. It was just a big part of life. And I remember, um, I just, I saw how happy it made my mom for me to go to church and to be a part of church and her happiness really mattered to me. Um, but I was so hurt and so angry from all the abuse I had suffered from men before that. And I couldn't wrap my head around, um, a God who would, in my mind, allow for that to happen, you know, as an innocent child. And I wasn't hearing any answers to those questions. And um, I don't, you know, it wasn't something that people just talked about all the time. And I remember at one point they had this altar call at church for people who wanted to get free from the past. And I sat there kind of feeling like, I think this is me, but I didn't know if I actually wanted to be free because I was like, well, what does that mean? And I was a little bit nervous about that. I remember my mom coming up and saying, why won't you just let God free you? But that just kind of fed my rage more because I felt like they had all moved on, but I was still stuck in the past. And my senior year of high school, I just reached a, a climax and all of that where I just could not deal with the pain and the anger and the rage anymore. And I tried to kill myself. I, I attempted suicide. Um, when I woke up, um, I was laying on the floor and uh, there was there was no sign of me being sick. I, I didn't have a headache. I didn't have a stomach ache. There was literally no evidence of anything ever happening. And um, I had this thought instantly in my head, you must be real. Mm -hmm. And I think that you love me and I will give you my life, but you have to set me free. I can't, that's my condition. I need to be set free. And from that point on, it just sent me on a journey of finding Jesus, growing with Jesus, diving into my Bible, reading my Bible, um, but also truly falling in love with Jesus and wanting to grow in my relationship with him. Amen. And when you mention uh, your past, um, people probably aren't too aware, but they can read the book. What's the title again? It's called Brave Surrender. Brave Surrender. Mm -hmm. And you talk about, it was a lot of physical abuse from men. Yes. And in that it's hard to break out of that because, yes. and a lot of people can relate, but the encouraging thing for those who are listening, we get people emailing us about suicidal thoughts and wanting to take their life. The greater the brokenness, mm -hmm. the greater the anointing. Mm -hmm. So I believe that what is God, God has called you to do in that anointing from your worship is coming from that place of pain. Yeah. I don't like it either because, yeah. you know, I, I ran from God in my teenage years and cost me a lot. And I don't want crystal myth, steroids, alcohol, you name it. 
and just a broken man. With the, but God used that brokenness to to really, uh, you rely on him more, yeah. you know, there's a deeper relationship with, with him. And you actually w- walked right into the first question with that. The real issue I think out there is vibrant, expressive, emotional worship and people who don't like that, <laughs> yeah. they're going to come against that. Yeah. And I think we forget that revivals are always mocked. I mean, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I've got a stack of books yeah. on revivals, the Welsh revivals, New Hebrides revivals, uh, Great Awakenings, all these revivals, and Whitfield Wesley's. It's always, they're messy. I mean, that people are at, at the altar, and now, you know, but if you do that, well, don't do that, it's too emotional. Really? What? When you encounter God, that's the most powerful, that's the most powerful event of your life. Yeah. So I think a lot of these people just have never real, really experienced experience the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. And I think that's where your emotion comes from, right? It's not just yeah. let's, um, let's work people up in emotional frenzy mm-hmm. um, because that's what they say, you know, yeah. emotionalism, you're brainwashing people. Sometimes, like I told you, I, I hit, I hit that song. Is it, is it just be every, el- yeah. everything else can wait. Yeah. I mean, I hit rewind on that 20 times, yeah. just, just weeping before God and broken. And, and then I start to prepare my sermon from it. God, just, just the power of the spirit working through that brokenness. And yeah. so what are your thoughts on that type of emotional worship? Probably the yeah. same. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, when, when you know what you've been saved from, when you, when, when you talk about like that brokenness, the darkness, I, I remember, I'm not so far removed that I don't remember the brokenness and, and the pit that I was in that he saved me Amen. from. The, the, the conversion and the encounter with Jesus was so radical. I mean, it altered my life forever and has now <laughs> altered the life of my children, you know, the, the generations coming behind me. And that kind of, um, the, the magnitude of that moment and that decision, there's something in me that I cannot help but worship. Yeah. One, one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, um, what do you do when you don't feel like worshiping? And, you know, you don't feel like getting up and going to worship, whatever it is. And I'm like, well, I don't really know. I don't know what that's like because I might have a a day where I feel tired or whatever else it is, but all I do is I just remember what he's done Mm. for me and I can't help but feel like I just want to worship him. I forget the song. I don't think worship is about songs. I think worship is about this relationship. Uh, Exactly. And I think that no matter what the song is, it could be a a, a hymn. It could be like the oldest song and I would still get choked up and Mm. have emotions Mm. because I am so close connected in relationship with Jesus. And if, you know, Jesus is alive. Our God is not dead. We get to have a real relationship with him. And in my mind, that's like, well, I mean, I have a relationship with my husband. It'd be pretty weird if I had zero emotions in that relationship. That's true. So how would I have a relationship with a living God and not feel anything about that? It actually doesn't make sense to my, my brain. And so while there's nothing in me that would ever want to try to, you know, I can't force people to worship. I have been in churches where it's very conservative, Mm -hmm. where they just kind of stare at me while I'm leading worship (laughs) and I'm not phased. You can ask my, my closest friends, someone who's here with me. It does not phase me because I know that the spirit of God will do what he wants to do. And I don't control that. I can't force God to do something. I can't force people to worship. I could sit up here trying to make something happen, but ultimately Mm -hmm. I'm not in control. I'm just surrendering to him. I'm trying to make space for him to move. And ultimately what's happening is, is up to him, (laughs) you know? And so I can't, I can't force even an emotional response from people because that's between them and God. I'm trying to encourage worship. I'm trying to encourage surrender to Jesus. I'm trying to encourage um, a passion in that relationship, but I can't well, force anything to happen. I, I wish it try. was. I wish it was tomorrow morning already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to go into worship. Um, but that is that's so true, Kim, because. Um, when I preach, sometimes I talk about the dead church or legalistic Pharisees or those who are not engaged. You can't get them at worship events. And and um, we have a child. We experience tremendous emotion. You should have seen the emotions that happened when the Dodgers won <laughs> here in L.A. County. I mean, so you see, that's people say, I'm just not emotional. No, you express anger real well. Yeah. You express the problem is it's the worship towards God. 
True. The heart. I don't think these people have been. Now, of course, I mean, a man sitting at sitting in the pew, just worshiping God with amazing grace. He doesn't have mm-hmm. to stand up and right. do things. There's different preferences, I think, because yes. I'm more conservative. Yes. You know, I'm probably not going to be the the jumping around the stage yeah. kind of guy. Yeah. I'm just just more conservative. But I think we have to allow people those freedoms. And I'm I'm really impressed with emotional worship if it's God centered, Christ centered, doctrinally sound. Yes. And um, where do you do you write some of your own songs? I- I do. And I was going to say, um, for me, I, I prefer to do co-writing. I don't like to do writing on my own. I prefer to, to work with other writers. And I kind of love that pretty much all of the writers I write with come from different streams and are in different churches, different congregations. Some of them are in more conservative streams. And this is something that as songwriters we wrestle through is the theology. We we do not write anything flippantly. I mean, I, I can't speak for all of them, but the, the writers that I work with, we don't write anything flippantly. And there's nothing in us that wants to just write a purely emotional song. We want a song, first of all, we're thinking about, we would love to write a story a song that the body of Christ can sing, not just one stream of church. Oh, gotcha. We would also love to write a song that I don't think we're ever going to please everyone when it comes to theology, but mm-hmm. we would like to please most, maybe. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Like and, on the essentials. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, we wrestle through that and we push each other back. We, you know, we, we'll, well, someone will say something and we'll go, okay, well, what do you mean by that exactly? Because it kind of sounds like you're saying this. And I don't mm-hmm. think that's correct theologically. And we really push each other on that. Do we have it perfect 100% of the time? I don't yeah. know, yeah. And, but we're, we are doing our best. We'll call pastors and we'll say, yeah. hey, a bunch of songwriters here working on this song right now. We've got this line we're kind of stuck on. What do you think about this? We welcome the input. Um, I've even tried That's to good. say before, listen, you got a problem with the theology of this song. Talk to me about it. I am I am receptive of feedback. I am, I, And I believe that my job as a worship leader is to serve the body of Christ. And so if I'm not doing that, I would love to have a conversation. I would love the feedback. I would love the input. And I know that um, there's enough humility in me to say, I'm not a perfect theologian and I'm still growing and learning. And like I said, I'm very open to those conversations, but I think it's good to point out that that is something that we wrestle through as a a group of songwriters. That's great to know. Um, and I think, cause I agree, I don't have any, but the, I think the, the dissenting voice, if I could word it that way would be, um, not just you, I just mean in general, the contemporary worship is, they would say lacking in that old rugged cross doxology, imputed righteousness of Christ and that those, those deep truths of the Bible. Yeah. However, you know, um, like the song I mentioned, I, I don't, I, I, it's, it's here, but um, just be everything else can wait. I've come here to seek your face. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if there's ever been a time I've not been on that altar just broken before God because of those lyrics are yeah. engaging my heart with God's heart. Yes. And so, um, I, and I think there's different callings. You know, your calling in some of the contemporary music is to, where Shane and Shane has their own type of calling. And, and you, it's more of that bringing young people, millennials into the Lord. God forbid millennials are listening to Kim Walker Smith all day. I mean, you know, um, so that, that's so important on that area of worship. And there's just a few things. And we only had about 10 minutes, just so you know, it's not like I, I don't, you've never seen these questions. And, and, and I asked a few things about 10 minutes ago, but a lot of times the Bible uh, question comes up is, is the Bible your final authority inerrant, the inerrant scripture? Absolutely. And then I asked you, which is good to know, about the Passion Translation. And what you said was very important in that um, you, you, you didn't, you, I don't know if you knew this, but when you said, I don't know a lot about it, it's a new translation, um, it was recommended, I think that's what's happening. I mean, a lot, we don't, nobody has time to investigate these right. things. And, and it's very new. Right. And so the accuracy, you wouldn't use it as a study Bible. It's no. more of, so when you quote it, like I read a couple of your uh, devotionals that were really good, and I saw the Passion Translation, which I probably wouldn't have interpreted the scripture the way they did. It wasn't, um, you know, way out there. It, it, it's actually what they call a dynamic equivalence. It's a thought for thought translation of the Bible, not a formal equivalent. So um, when, when, when people say, well, Kim used the Passion Bible, you actually don't use it as a study Bible. It's just yeah. a more of a general, like good reading and, and look and getting the nuances from the words. Yeah. And what I was saying was if I were to prepare a sermon, that would not be the one that no. I would go to right. for that sort of thing. 
Um, I think as a songwriter, as an artist, I love the poetic yep. way that it's written. Um, but like I said, I don't know enough about it. I, it's so new um, that I couldn't speak to all of the accuracy of it. So like I said, I it's something that I, I think is beautiful the way it was written. I love the poetic nature. But as far as like what I'm going to is the study Bible, I would go to something different. Yeah, sure. and that's ex that's why I mentioned it. I'm glad you said that because I get frustrated at the people who would like say make negative comments because you use it not knowing the history behind, hey, it's just a good, like I don't like the Message Bible by Eugene Peterson as a study Bible, but you know, if I'm going to read a comment, like okay, here's what he said, here's what, I actually I grew up, when I came back to the Lord, I love the uh, NLT, the New Living Translation, yeah. as far as just bringing light to the Scriptures, uh -huh. but then as I study, I'd say, well, I, I don't really see that. I don't, so you, if people understand these Bibles aren't study Bibles, we don't get our, our theology from them, we get our theology from formal equivalents, where it's word for word, yeah. the Greek and the Hebrew try to line up as close as they can. Um, it's funny as you're talking about the emo I just thought of this on worship. When Martin Luther was writing hymns or the or, or Wesley, uh, his brother, yeah. they were actually considered new hymns. Mm -hmm. But now they're old hymns. Yes. <laughs> so we have to remember that God gives new voices to yes. sing new songs sometimes. It's but the, I don't think we'll ever settle the worship wars on this side of heaven. No. Um, <laughs> and then so I think we discussed about repeating lyrics. Uh, to me, it's not chanting brainwashing but when you when you're like and like tomorrow i told you camp out at a song i mean I, you, you took 40 minutes at the stadium to do four songs yeah. i mean it was just incredible and yeah. and because why because you're engaging it's not like okay there's four minutes let's go to the next song yeah. four minutes okay let's do a quick announcement quick sermon let's mm -hmm. go have a potluck worship is can take 10 minutes of the song and, and holy holy is your name we yeah. worship you and if you're and if god's moving in the heart and you're camping out there and let the holy spirit work into the the hearts of those who are here versus just stopping that. Yeah. Because I think sometimes if we don't press in, right, we don't quite receive, you know, maybe as much as we could have. Yeah. And there's, there's two things that are in my, my mind in those moments. The first one is, I think that so often, um, church becomes a routine for us that we are used to, you know, Sunday morning, we go to church service. There's mm -hmm. a few songs. The pastor <laughs> speaks. It ends with a hallelujah or a, yes, thank you, Lord. And then we go out to lunch with our friends. We go home and fall asleep watching golf or some sports game. I don't know. Like that's yeah. most people's Sunday afternoon right there. And so we just fall into the routine and forget that, we've actually come into a moment, number one, that's super powerful, us coming together to all worship Jesus together, but also you've come into an opportunity to have your life changed. Like, I, I think that every oh, time man. we come together, our lives can be changed. Great like, point. isn't that the beauty of God, that there's always a new facet of him to see and to discover and to learn about? And um, so in those moments when I'm trying to like kind of pause and wait a moment, I'm trying to give opportunity for people to break out of the routine because when we, there's moments that you, you just, you can get so caught in the routine that you're singing the words on the screen and not considering what they actually mean. You're for thinking you. about lunch. You're, yeah. You're singing about, you know, you're telling Jesus how much you love him in this song and not even considering about wow. what that means in that moment. And so I'm trying to, to give a moment for people in the repetition to actually think about what they're saying and to have a moment there <laughs> and let that sit in. And how do you want to respond as those words are coming out of your mouth? What kind of response does that provoke that you want to give God? The other thing that I'm thinking about in those moments is that to me, the most beautiful sound in worship is not what's coming from the stage, what's not, not what's coming out of me, but what's coming out here. The sound of people actually worshiping him in the moment, in their own words, in their own way. Forget about the songs. What do you want to say to Jesus right now? How do you want to worship him? And I don't care. Music is not about, worship's not about a talent. It's not about a skill. Who cares if you can sing or not? It is a beautiful expression for us to be lifting our hearts and our devotion to Jesus. And that, it, I'm trying to make room for to hear that sound and to encourage that sound to come out of people. Wow, that's, that's you, you're, what you're saying now is what I preach on Sundays often about worship shouldn't be boring it should be engaging and um, we don't do it now because it's the church gets too full but we used to have our children's ministry um, maybe 70 80 kids up there 
during worship and to hear them, it's, you'd hear them singing, you yeah, know, during those, I mean, it's yeah. like parents are crying. It's like, just, yeah. it's just incredible. So, yeah. um, we tackled that one with the Bible as the final authority. Um, and then questions come in about, you know, Jesus culture is light on sin. I don't know about they, but you, I know you're not, we've talked about no. sin, repentance, your book talks about repentance uh-huh. and, and the blood of Christ and Absolutely. judgment and all the things. I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to maxim, we don't want to elevate all these, you know, the hard things, but we also don't want to sweep them under the rug and just talk about right. grace and mercy. It's it's the totality of yes. of God's word. So yes, okay, good on that one. Yep. Um, <laughs> it's kind of funny to mention, but the grave sucking you didn't even know much about it. <laughs> no, right? I, was, I mean, I've heard the term. I don't know much about that. I don't do that. <laughs> I don't know anyone what, who does. <laughs> actually, we should. On this point, it would be good to clarify. You're not. You're actually not part of Bethel. Even though you came out of Bethel, mm-hmm. when you when you launched out, you're, it, uh, there's really not there's relationship, I guess, but there's not affiliation doctrinally. You know, it's just a Jesus whole different. Jesus culture is separate. Jesus culture. We planted a church six years ago. Um, we still have relationship. You know, the friendships. That's for where sure. we came yeah. out of. You know, and um, for me, I ended up at Bethel in 2000. Uh, back then, it was not what it is now. Like yeah. no one had written any books. Or the school ministry had just started. It was very small. It's very different from what it is now. And um, it's hard. Like it, there's there's a lot of things out there on the internet. There's a lot of things that um, some of it I just scratch my head and go, I don't, I don't know. I don't yeah. know what to say about that. Yeah, it's kind of weird. There's other <laughs> things that I'll go, well, I was actually there during that particular thing. And that's kind of taken out of context. Yeah. That's not quite right. And um, for me, to be honest, um, I I am really thankful for the, for my time there, for what God did in me personally, mm-hmm. that I, I grew in my relationship with God. I grew in my word. I remember just sitting for hours memorizing scripture and uh, making flashcards of scripture and walking around memorizing that. That, um, you know, there's an atmosphere of freedom that is encouraged there. And I know that when there's an, such an atmosphere of freedom, it can also have some really weird things. That's true. So That's I understand true. that. But what it did for someone like me was give me the freedom to, at times, cry at the altar and be pouring out my heart to Jesus and, and other times go... I'm, I'm angry and I don't have answers to this. And there were people there that were, were ready to walk through that, the, the questions, the doubting, all of those things with me. Um, so I was, I'm very thankful for the time that I had there. I'm thankful for the relationships. I'm thankful for the mothers and fathers that, um, encouraged me and pushed me and believed in me. Do I have answers to all the things that, that people come up with now? No, I don't. And, and I know looking on from the outside, yeah, there's some things that are weird, but for me, I'm like, well, I'm thankful for what, what God did in me personally. Um, it's not my home anymore, right. uh, but there's people there that I love and, um, yeah. And it was explained to me just so people know we we're, we're not affiliated either. I don't, I don't, we don't promote it. We don't, well, the thing is, well, you play Kim's music. So obviously you're guilt by association. Like, mm-hmm. well, no, we don't have anything to do with Bethel. And somebody broke it down to me. They said, they're, they're out on the fringe as far as let's try this. Let's try this. Let's try this. See if God's in it. Where I'm like, no, I gotta, I gotta know if God's in it first. Mm-hmm. You know, I gotta, I, uh, scripture is, so right. we, we would lean towards more conservative theologically. And, uh, so I can't really comment on there because I don't, I, I don't know anyone yeah. really uh, there, but the grave sucking is supposedly where a person lays on the grave and receives this anointing from someone else. Obviously, you, you know that you, you, you never, done never that. done that. Yeah, I haven't either. I went to graves of people who you respect, and you can say, "Lord, I love that same anointing." I mean, that's a given. Gold dust, glory clouds, angel feathers. No, I... again, I, I mean, I've, I've heard all the same things that everyone else has. Um, I have, I don't have any explanation for any of that. I can't say it did or did not happen. Um, okay. Yeah, I have no, I, I don't even know what to, to say to that one. But I, I have thought before, like, um, like, have you ever read any of the books about like all the old revivals back in the day? Um, all the different revivalists, mm-hmm. like the tent revivals and things like that. Some of the things I've read in those story, I'm like. Some of those things sound pretty weird and far fetched to me too. Yeah. Some of the things going on. So I'm kind of like Well what happens is when God is moving in a spirit of revival, so is the enemy. And so when Jonathan Edwards, for example, was yeah. was preaching his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, they actually it was he was just monotone from a manuscript and the Spirit of God hit that place in New England and started the first great awakening. But it was said that people would hold on to trees. 
as not to fall into the abyss of hell because he was, he was saying like a spider, you know, hung over the, the God could just drop you at any moment. People would hold on to that. Uh, under the preaching of George Whitfield, people would fall down. It just all, just prostrate, fall down because it, it's hard because it, it knocks us out of our comfort zone. But when God is really moving, I mean, I've been at places, I couldn't even go up and preach because the atmosphere was yeah. so heavy. Yeah. Uh, I remember one time at our other church location, the f- worship was, you know, when the worship is like, it's thick and God, God's moving. People are weeping. It's a spirit of revival. I went up and I just announced, I'm not going to preach. We're just going to go into revival. And half the church is at the altar and, and lives are being restored. Marriages are being restored. Prodigal sons are coming home. That's not the work of the devil. But what happens in revival is you do... Um, uh, genuine revivals, I, I guess you you have the work of the Holy Spirit and you have the work of the enemy. So emotions kind of get yeah. uh, going as well. Yeah. Uh, but then there were like the New Hebrides revivals of Duncan Campbell in the 1940s, where it was a more of a of a of a Calvinistic, but more of a just a, a conservative revival, if you could say that. People would be weeping, but you'd be singing on the streets. Bars closed down, and so it's messy. And I think where God's moving, so is the enemy. Yeah. And if we're not careful, we can allow. Because uh, I, I kind of cringe when so many people attribute something weird to the Holy Spirit. It's like, uh, if, the, if it's odd, it's God. Not necessarily. You no, know, you yeah. got you, you got to use wisdom. Yeah, and I will say, um, one time I heard Bill say, um, it's a problem if you're seeking the gifts more than the one who gives them. And I would say that's where it can get really weird is if you have people maybe... Uh, witnessing miracles or anything else like what you're talking about and suddenly that becomes the thing that they're going after after and pursuing that more than actually pursuing God yeah. and and that relationship. So I think that anytime there is things happening like that, there's going to be um, critics, but there's also going to be people who have come into it maybe originally seeking freedom or seeking God, but have turned into a way of like seeking out those other things yeah, wrong versus motives. actually seeking out God. Very wrong motives. And that's where we send the wrong message to the, to, to those kind of searching, um, if we're not careful anyway. But I know like even in the prayer room, for example, we had a lady, uh, demonic manifestation, like up against the wall, we're praying and like people like in the prayer room were like, some of them just kind of walked out like, well, that's weird. But it's God delivering someone. Mm-hmm. So this nice, tidy, tidy Christianity is not necessarily biblical Christianity. And in these dire times of where America's going, we're going to have to get out of our comfort zone yeah. and start relying on the Holy Spirit to heal, to set free. I, and we try to keep the, you know, the services as, as like Paul said, done, to do things decently and in order. But if the Holy Spirit is, I mean, many times we've had dozens at the altar and, and I, I'm like, well, I'm not going to stop them. I mean, how is that a bad thing? So I think it's just being said, it really has to fall a lot falls on the leadership yes. of, of where you're going to direct this, this flow. Always God's will to heal. Uh, we talked briefly about that. You, you kind of had that, you faced that, that question mm-hmm. kind of a, recently, right? A few years ago. Yeah. And that, explain that. That was a yeah. good. So, um, my stepfather, the one who I mentioned earlier, George, who's the reason I'm, I'm saved and serving God, uh, he got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And um, he had it for 11 years. And during that time, let me just say, George loved worship. Loved worship. He loved to worship. He um, he loved to watch me lead worship. He wow. loved music. He loved singing. He played a few different instruments. He just loved worship. But he really, really loved God. He would get up every Every single morning faithfully before the sun rose and he would turn on worship music and I would see him in there crying and mm-hmm. praying and reading his word and he would be um, praying saying thank you God for my girls he would be praying for us which at the time as a teenager really offended me because I was so like rejecting of him um, but now I look back on that with such fondness but I see um, just his heart and his passion for God when he got diagnosed um, he never stopped asking God to heal him He never stopped believing that God could heal him, and he never stopped believing that God is healer. Mm -hmm. And um, I I had lots of faith and believed that with him, Um, especially, you know, coming from Bethel, this is something that, that they taught us and have always believed that God heals and that he, he, he can do that. Um, but I was 
trying to figure out this very question. Does he heal all of the time? And, and I was at Bethel long enough to see that some people came and they did get healed, but sometimes they didn't. So I knew that it didn't happen all of the time, but trying to figure out, well, why is that from a lack of faith? Is that, you know, just not having the answer to all those questions. But at this moment, when I was watching him, um, slowly just get worse and worse and worse. And even, um, it got down to his final days and he could barely open his mouth to speak or worship. And he would just be kind of mumbling and he just never stopped asking God to heal him. And then he passed away. And after that, I was really, sorry, caught in this moment as a worship leader, and I'm singing songs Mm. about God being a healer and healing, and I'm walking off stage and going, is that really who you are? Do you really heal? And um, really wrestling through that. And what I encountered from Jesus was that he met me in that place. He didn't... um, He wasn't mad at me for wrestling through that. He wasn't mad at me for having questions. Um, And he was just working through that with me slowly. And I feel like it matured me even more as a Christian. But I think what I came out knowing was that he does not always heal. And why does he not always heal? I don't have the answers to that. But I decided in that moment that I want him more than I want the answers. That I don't actually need all of the answers to feel close to Jesus. And I um, I don't actually need to understand all of the mysteries of God. I think that the fact that there are still so many mysteries and unanswered questions is what keeps me in pursuit. So I'm really okay with that. But sometimes I kind of have to wrestle through those things, and that's exactly what I had to do with that. And, you know, why did he not heal him? I don't know. When I get to heaven, I can have a conversation with with God about it. But he does not always do that. Wow, that is that is really good perspective. And hopefully the young millennials that are watching Watching this understand that too that like you said God can heal I believe he wants to heal in many cases and of course faith has a role in that to some degree you know many Jesus can do many good works because of their unbelief right. uh, but also people would intercede and the person who was healed wasn't even praying for their own healing and but we also trust in God's sovereignty you know we know that our, li- our lives here are numbered and if that number is here, the healing, no matter how hard you pray, yeah. you know, um, God is going to bring you home, the ultimate yeah. healing. So that's a, that's a good balance to have, that he can heal. We're going to pray for it. We're going to contend for it. Um, like even if I, I mentioned, if one of my children is, is deathly sick or even happens to die right there, I'm going to pray for healing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to believe in that. And yeah. if God chooses not to do that, mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's yeah. his sovereign will. I will add to that that um, something I've been even talking about with some of my closest friends just processing through this, uh, something that I think that we don't always talk about enough in the more charismatic side of things is um, (laughs) walking through like the bad things, the hardships, you know? I think sometimes there's a message amongst the charismatic churches that it's just all joy and happy and that if you're good with God, that you should be (laughs) blessed, that you should have everything going perfect for you. That, and, and that's just not, that's not true that, uh, just because anyone who's been in church long enough knows that giving your life to Jesus does not mean that it's going to be bliss from here on out and being in right relationship with Jesus doesn't mean that everything's going to be bliss either. The thing that really turned things around for me was many, many years ago, I felt like I was just walking through the desert and I felt like, where are you, God? You've abandoned me. What did I do wrong? Where did did I sin somewhere? Did I mess up? Like what's happening? And I found Hosea 2.14, which now is my favorite scripture. It says, therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert. And it talks about making a valley of of, um, hope and a door of hope in the valley of trouble. It goes on to talk about restoration. But the key thing for me that I read right there, it says, I will lead her into the desert. And I was like, you led me here. You led me into the desert. You did this on purpose. And I, I realized in that moment, like, 
if, if he is sovereign, like you said, and I'm a life that's given to him, I'm surrendered to him, then yes, even through the valleys, even through the desert, he's mm-hmm. leading me through those and recognizing that these are all opportunities to grow in intimacy with him. These are opportunities to have my faith grow. These are opportunities to learn to hear him in a new way, to learn to see him in a new way. It completely changed my perspective that even in the really bad times, the bad moments, that he's still there and he's still the one leading me through. And Proverbs says, man makes his plans, but the Lord aligns his steps. And I believe that. And that's, I I was just mentioning to a friend, I feel like we don't always talk about it enough Mm -hmm. in the charismatic side of things about, um, you know, you talk to people and I think, Everyone would agree, like, no, being a, be, becoming a Christian doesn't mean it's just going to be easy and <laughs> blessed all the time, you know, whatever. But it's just not always talked about um, the, the hardships in our walk with Jesus, you know. I'm tempted to say something, but I don't know if I will. It's not about you, but it's, uh, <laughs> well, if, if the election doesn't go the way many people want, millions of Christians are about to find out how hard, <laughs> right. it, hard it can get. Right. Um, but that was just a, a side note. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is one deficiency in the charismatic movement is, you know, even when people walk in church, praise the Lord, brother, I'm doing great when they're not. Mm-hmm. And it's all, you know, you should be, you should actually be wealthy, mm-hmm. you know, and unhealthy. And, right. you know, so that is, but that, it's just not, no, that's, it's not biblical either for sure. Um, but on that too, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you know, I, I watch like, um, sometimes people send me wretched radio. And, uh, you know, the, they, they're just against any type of things we're talking about. Um, uh, and it's always like they're poking fun at people who had dreams or like, oh, prophetic words, like God spoke to me, ha, 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 ha. But they don't understand that the Bible's our final authority. Like God spoke to you through his word. Yeah. And if the Holy Spirit leads you mm-hmm. a prophetic word, somebody speaks prophetically into your life that lines up with scripture. We don't put that above the Bible. Right. It's in addition to the scriptures that we're reading and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our life through. And you've seen at your concerts, the Holy Spirit moving in a a powerful way too. Yeah. Yes. Uh, This is why I think um, community is so powerful and so important to be plugged into a church um, and to have people speaking into your life because I've, I've known the people who um, it just went weird. Yeah. (laughs) Like they, no accountability. Yes, exactly. And they're the people who are always trying to do it on their own and kind mm-hmm. of go their own way. And that's why I think it really helps that you have people around you and even people that you don't always agree with on everything, but that you will allow them to speak into your life and kind of test you on things. Teachable. Yes. Humble. Iron sharpens iron. I mean, it's biblical, right? Yes. Amen. <laughs> That's so good. And people, um, we're actually, I don't know if it's, hopefully it's working because we're testing out, but we're going live. So I didn't know, I didn't know what you're going to say on a lot of this. Um, but just trusting, you know, that God, the Holy Spirit is, is doing the same work in a lot of us in this yeah. next generation. Uh, this one is kind of funny. I mentioned the NAR and you don't even know what that is. I said, I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, apparently you're part of the, na- the, uh, I don't even know, apostolic reformation movement or something. So I'm not going to spend much time in there, but it's so funny. People say an NAR church or she's part of the, part of the NAR. And, and it's, I guess it's this movement where they put too much hierarchy on the apostle. You know, apostles should lead the church and bring in the kingdom of God and the world's going to get, you know, um, uh, better, not worse. And so anyway, that, that was it on that. You, you've never heard of it uh, or much. And I hadn't heard of, of it until I was accused of being part of it because <laughs> when did it start? Oh, Brian and Katie were leading worship in Fresno. Francis Chan was speaking. So I was backstage with Francis Chan and Derek Carr with the Raiders. And I did a picture with Francis. And then when it hit the internet, I got all these, you know, all these accusations against me. I'm being part of the NAR and false prophet and and things. So it's just funny. I feel sorry for some of these people because they're, I don't know if they're even saved themselves, Yeah. you know, to be, right. to be that, you know, that yeah. it's just, yeah. And then uh, quickly the one on angels. It's funny. You know, I brought up the, 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 the video I saw, I think it was from Bethel where one of the kids ministry directors told the kids, okay, go out and find angels and tell us, report back what they told you. Now, just hearing that, of course you would say, well, that sounds weird. That's uh, if we don't do, but to actually be in some of these things where oh, that's not what they said. That's not what they did. You've seen things blown out of proportion, yes. but you've also seen things where like, ah, I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I try to be so careful because here, here's the thing. 
I know what it feels like to be judged. Really? Just on something. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, I, I get that. Um, I have dealt with the critics and the judgments and, and it's been, you know, I've had the moments crying with my husband and going, they don't even know me. Like they don't even know my heart. They, right. they're, and, well, that's what this is for. Yes, exactly. And it's so, it's so hard and frustrating. So I don't want to become the very thing that's been so painful for me. So it's, I try to be really careful not to judge without going, well, I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know the context. Like it's, it's so hard to say in those moments. And, um, there, and like I said, there are times I'm like looking at a video, I'm going, yeah, that's weird. I don't know yeah. what to say about that. Yeah, exactly. It's weird. Then other times going, I, you know, the context, I feel like the context could be taken out. I, I will say, you know, for me, um, with my kids, I tell them every night, God has sent angels to surround you and protect you. And, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not telling them to go look for angels or, you know, try to talk to the angels. I tell them to talk to God. Yeah. Um, but I, we, and we read, um, we read our Bible every night together and they read the stories about the angels yeah. in the Bible. So they understand it's that's a real thing. Yeah. It's a, it's a biblical thing. Um, I don't put a ton of, uh, emphasis on that because I'm just trying to teach them about Jesus right now. Um, but yeah, those are, those are again, some of the things that you like, well, some of it's weird. I, I can't really speak to that, yeah. but then other times I'm like, well, that's, taken out of context. Yeah, that's so. true. That's that's a good point. Um, and for those just tuning in, if you're hearing this later, you know, make sure to rewind and listen to the beginning, the opening, where we kind of set the stage for all of this. Um, is there any closing thoughts you have for any millennials watching? Um, my thought would be, you know, there's if, if you're struggling with suicide, depression, um, check the obvious. You know, is there besetting sin? Have you not repented and, and ever and, and believed in who Jesus is instead of just kind of riding your parents' coattails? Or you go to church or you own a Bible, but have you truly repented and believed in Jesus? It's fully surrendered. That's why I love a lot of the songs in your book. It's the fully surrendered life. That's the only life. And then as you surrender and you're empty, you're filled with the Spirit. You know, yeah. really, it's beautiful how that works. I mean, that was probably the, one of the hardest parts for me in, when I was first walking through this was surrender truly <laughs> was costing everything to truly surrender my life. It meant that I also had to surrender my unforgiveness. I had to surrender my pain. I had to surrender my r anger and my rage. I had to set, uh, surrender my need for justice. I, I kept saying, God, I want you to bring justice and punish these people yep, who hurt exactly. me. And I had to surrender that. I had to lay down everything. And you know, um, when you have been through pain and trauma, Anger is actually a coping mechanism. It is. You get it mad, is how you, lash you out. deal with the pain. And so to be surrendering those things felt even scarier and even harder because suddenly it was it, part of me is going, how will I cope with this? How will I cope with, um, how will I face the pain? <laughs> how yes. will I, and, and in the moment of surrendering to Jesus, what you don't always know is that he's going to meet you in that pain and bring healing and, and bring the redemption and, and turn, <laughs> turn your life around in that moment. But in order to get to that, you have to first surrender. And I know that it can be scary because you don't know what's on the other side of surrender. But if you ask any of us who have been there and done that, we'll tell you that it's going to be the best thing for you on the other side of Amen. surrender is Jesus meeting you in that place and bringing the fulfillment to your life and heart that you have been longing for That's and true. crying yeah. out for, you know, um, I, I would also say, you know, to, especially you mentioned the young people watching, um, it, I would say it, don't try to, uh, learn the word to your parents, read the word for yourself, yeah. read the word for yourself, get involved in a Bible study. Lots of campuses have Bible studies, uh, and then get in community, get in a church body where you can be around other people, other Christians, and you can have people pouring into you, mothers and fathers. Um, I know that there's, there is a, a lot of people in this generation who come from broken homes who maybe not, they don't have a stable mother or a stable father. Maybe yeah. they don't have either one. Um, getting in a solid church community is a good place to have people like that pouring into you. How do you, it sounds like your worship comes from what God's pouring into your heart. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I worship him because I'm, 
I feel like I, I owe a debt of gratitude <laughs> to Jesus wow. for what he did in my life. Um, and you know, this is not actually what I planned on doing with my life. This wasn't even what I was right. trying to do with my life. Uh, you didn't I, make the singing auditions, right? No, or, I, I, I auditioned for the worship team at my Christian school and I didn't make it. <laughs> I, I got kicked out of choir when I was in high school. I, I mean, anytime I tried to do anything musical, it never worked. Wow. And this was never my plan. And I'll have young people, you know, come to different events and they, they raise their hand and they say, I want to do what you're doing when I grow up. So how do I do it? How do I do it? I'm like, I honestly have no answers for you because really I had my eyes so fixed on Jesus. And I remember at one point I said to Jesus, I don't care what I do with the rest of my life. You can put me in any career. I will go pump gas. Now in Oregon, we're not allowed to pump gas. So that's actually a job. I found out later that I would say that I would say, if you have to go pump gas and people look at me like what? And I'm like, okay, I'm from Oregon. That's actually a job there. But my point is I I would say to him, I will literally do anything. But I, as long as I have you, as long as I have this relationship with you, as long as it's close and it's alive and it's real and I'm great growing in my relationship with you, put me anywhere. And in that, just fixated on him. My eyes are on him. My eyes are on a job. My eyes eyes are on a theology or a church. My eyes are just on him and I'm moving towards him. And in that movement, he's just led me into this. It wasn't, I didn't try to make this happen. I didn't knock on doors. I have never called a single church and said, can I come lead worship at your church? I have never tried to make anything happen. Anytime a door has opened, it has been him opening that door and leading me into that. Because you surrender to whatever you want to do. And that's my concern with uh, like people they'll ask you or pastors, young pastors ask me or that it's, you have to make sure you're doing it for the right reason because mm-hmm. if they want the limelight mm-hmm. and the popularity and the notoriety, they right. won't know the anointing of God. You, but also, you will crumble underneath. Oh God! That. If you're not called, that, that's the you're other done. thing. Like it, the weight of that, you you will crumble underneath of it. I I I, I recognize now moments way long ago where he was building what was needed inside of me to be able to stand where I am now. Exactly. And at the time I was squirming in that going, ah, this is so uncomfortable. I hate this. But now I'm so thankful for Mm -hmm. all of those times that built a foundation inside of me that, um, helps sustain me for where he has put me now. That's a good word for someone listening because no matter what you're going through now, waiting time is not wasted time. That's right. God's got you in a spot. I mean, you, uh, if, if I had ever had time to share my, I mean, God actually had me pumping septic tanks and humbled myself and humble and broken wow. and humble and broken. And I said, Lord, I'll do whatever you want to do. I was in construction, yeah. you know, and, and to have doing this now, it's like, that's why I don't give up because I know I've been called because he put me here. Same with you. Yeah. And you can get through the challenges because it's his work, not my work. And looking back, It's because of all the things I went through. It provides a foundation for today. But the big question on the minds of many is when you get up in the morning and you worship, you don't put on Kim Walker. (laughs) I'm not usually listening to myself. Not usually. (laughs) Do you you just sing or do you put on someone else? You know, it's really funny. I mean, if I'm going to have a moment of worship, I will just sing. I will just worship. I won't really listen to anything. Okay. But I love the silence. And maybe it's because I'm so used to singing all the time, but I love just to sit in silence and listen. I, I love to just wait and, and listen to see if God wants to speak anything, you know, Amen. if I hear anything. Is that how you get some of your lyrics? Yeah. Cause that's how I get my yes. sermons. I get, I have to have a, a post-it notes next to me early in the morning because my sermons come from that quiet time yes. of God just pouring into your heart. Yes. And actually, um, when we were, when we were just talking about, you know, um, the, the time is not wasted. There was something I, I remembered a long time ago before I was leading worship in one of those moments where I'm just sitting in silence and I'm feeling like, like my brain is saying, nothing's happening. You're not hearing from God. Like this is wasting time. You should go do something else. And then right in that moment, as I'm wrestling through that, I actually did feel God speak to me. And he said, uh, one day you will live in the fruit of this moment. And I, that like, that has been something that that's been one of those foundational 
stones in, in my, my foundation, in my walk with That's God, powerful. that I have had to remind myself and still have moments where I have to remind myself, one day you will live in the fruit of this moment. Every decision counts. Every choice matters. Every time I choose to sit and listen, mm. even when I don't hear something, it matters. every time I sit to read my word and, you know, I'm not, I'm just reading. It feels like a, a routine. It's still life. It's still feeding me, whether you feel some big explosion of an emotion or not. It's still life. It's still feeding me. I'm still believing there will come a day I will live in the fruit of this moment. Wow. So that has been something I've held on to. But going back to the question, yes, oftentimes in those moments, um, I will just sing or I'm just sitting in silence and listening. Um, I try to uh, bring my kids into this more and trying to help them understand um that you can have a real relationship with God, that he's just, he's not far off, distant God, but that he's real, he's alive, he's inside of us. And um, so my bringing them into that has been um, saying, well, let's sing a worship song. Well, we don't know any worship songs right now. They don't have any songs like right. memorized except for like a couple lyrics here and there, you know. And I'll say, but you get to worship whatever you want to say to Jesus and trying to encourage that and encourage them. Well, let's listen. Let's take a moment and listen. Is there? Do you feel like Jesus is speaking anything? Thing to your that's heart. Good, yeah. And it's so amazing, actually, the things that they'll say that's so sweet and so pure and trying to encourage a relationship of how to hear God and how to worship God. Yeah. And the things that they'll they'll say, it's it's beautiful. I feel like sometimes it even pushes me. Yeah, and, for sure. Yeah, you know, sure. out of the mouths of babes. And this is this is real. How does it feel to homeschool? Oh man, this and is, you're on the road. This is the best part about homeschool. My husband and I, I mean I feel kind of funny saying this. We're kind of old school and we're older parents. Most, a lot of our, our uh, oh. people in our church who have kids, our kids age are like 10 years younger yeah. than us. Um, but we, we decided to homeschool because we decided, listen, we're going to control everything influencing yeah, our no children. Kidding. <laughs> That's no what we were like, what, you know, all the curriculum, what oh, they're yeah. watching, it's, what they're listening to. We're going to decide what all those That's influences biblical. are. I, I mean, it is. That's biblical. Yes. You have to watch their minds and guard. Yes. Um, question now that's been on, I, I want to ask you too, as I was watching a movie and I could have swore your song came on uh, about about the Trump I know, yes. the, the, all the ladies surrounding him yes. and, and, and all those things. But then I heard your song come on there. I'm like, you must have yeah. caught some heat for that one. Uh, yes, I did. <laughs> wow. I, I was did you asked, write that on your own? It's a very patriotic. I, I, well, okay, well. What's the title of that one? It's called Worth It All. You guys no, got, Yes. No, Worth the Fight. Worth the Fight. I, I was thinking of a different song, actually. Go to YouTube after this and put on Worth, Worth the, the Fight. fight. <laughs> yes, I was asked to write a song for America. And as I'm being asked about this, I'm thinking, okay, well, this is a, write a song for America. That's a tall order. Um, and I'm a worship leader. I write worship songs. I'm not usually writing like patriotic anthems or anything. Um, and then they go on further and I find out they want to put this song on a um, Trump documentary, a pro Trump documentary. And at first I was kind of like, oh, no, like I'm, I'm tired of controversy. I do not want to be in more controversy. <laughs> like, please, I need a break from controversy. Right. Um, but then my husband reminded me, um, he said, do you remember 11 years ago, we were at a conference and, um, the man who's there speaking, he's actually a really good friend of ours, a, a humble, um, prophetic uh, voice, just a really incredible man, um, someone who we really admire and look up to. But he was speaking at this conference, and all of a sudden he stops in the middle of his message, and he says, Kim, stand up. I have a word for you. Oh, Lord. And so I stand up, and he said, one day you're going to write a song for America. It's going to be no a, a patriotic anthem song. And I'm sitting there listening to him, and I come from a military family, so I am very patriotic, and I do love America. So that runs very deep inside of me because of how I was raised. Right. But in the moment I was like, well, that's awesome. But I kind of thought, whatever, how and why yeah. <laughs> kind of like tucked it away, you know, wasn't really thinking too much about it. But now fast forward 11 years later and you Skylar needed says, that, you needed that word to, yes, to go through. Yes. With and Skylar said, I think it's an act of obedience. I think you need to do this. And then I was like, how, okay, I agree. I should do this. But then I was like, how am I going to do this? This is, this is like hard. And Honestly, most um, Christian musicians, and I'm not going to say worship leaders, but most Christian musicians in like the like CCM world are pretty liberal and very um, anti-Trump. That might come as a shock to some, so I apologize if you're 
catching your breath right now, but that is the truth. And um, I was we should like, be able to talk about these things without people getting mad. You know, that's know. what's weird. It's weird the times we live in right now. But anyways, but I found um, one person who is one of my favorite people to write with. Her and I have written lots of songs together. Um, Just Be, the song that you mentioned. Be, yeah. We wrote that one together with another person. She's from Australia and she loves Trump. And so I asked her, <laughs> Would you write this song for me? It's not a song about Trump or for Trump, no, it's but different. it's going to be on a pro-Trump documentary. It's a song for America. And we poured our heart and soul into this song. And I love this it song. It was good. I, it's, I'm passionate about this song. It means a lot to me. It's going yes. back to our roots. It's going back to our roots yes. and back to the founding principles yes, and all those things. of what America was founded upon. Yes. Yeah. And um, I... I, you know, I know that America is not perfect. I am, I am so aware of our flaws, both in our past and in our present, but I don't know of a country that does not have that flawed past or a flawed Worse. present. Yeah. And I believe that America can still live up to all of the ideals that it represents. And I think that that's why we do have so many immigrants that want to come into mm -hmm. America because they see what it represents. And, um, so I, I don't, I wrote wrote this song just as a a tribute a to America. And a yes, and, and and what I believe about America. And that's what our heart is. It's not Trump. It's not. It's not the political parties. No. It's getting back to a nation that honors God in the court system, in the yes. schools. That you know, Congress shall make no law establishing religion. We're not establishing religion. We're acknowledging the sovereign hand of God. That's biblical. Right. And aborting children. I mean, there's some big, big yes. issues going on right now. So yes. it's just a matter of of uniting the true body of Christ to get back to seeking God as, and letting him be our foundation. Yeah. That was a great song. Thank you. No closing thoughts. <laughs> That's probably a good place. <laughs> That's to a end good closing right thought. <laughs> that is a good. Well, thank you so much, Kim. I mean, this is, yeah. I think going to help a lot of people. And uh, let me just, let me just close in prayer. Lord, I pray that those watching that don't know you, they would come to know you. They would repent and they would believe. And I pray the love of Christ would overshadow them. The Holy Spirit would fill them and they would have that hope and that peace that they so desperately need. And I also pray, Lord, for those who have hard hearts, prideful, arrogant, unteachable hearts. Lord, would you begin to melt them? melt them, show them you want to pour more into their hearts and, and their rigidness and their coldness and their callousness is, is preventing that. So Lord, would you break them and humble them? And then finally, I pray for tomorrow's service that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would be so thick in this place that lives would be changed. People will be healed and set free. Uh, we just pray that you get Kim and her, and her team home safely as they travel. And also just, just have her be blessed here while she's here away from her family coming to bless us. I pray that her family is also blessed in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Amen.